Whiteboard Wednesday. I'm enjoying doing these. Okay, um, if anyone is skiving off work, having a watch of this, drop me a comment below. Um, if you're not able to skive off work, you can always catch up with this later. So, um, today's topic that I'm going to talk about is about rate of progress. So, something that a lot of people um, fail to understand and can cause a lot of frustration um, along their journey. Morning, Christoph, Auntie Samantha. Yeah, that's me. Uncle Russ and Auntie Sam. Uh, who else we got? Uzi's here. Hope you're doing well, buddy. Hope fast is going okay. Um, so, yeah, rate of progress. And it's something that a lot of people don't necessarily understand going into something. And that's really important that you, you get your head around kind of how long this stuff takes. Um, because it stops you getting frustrated if you feel like progress isn't going very quickly or it's um, you know, not as fast as you'd like it. Or last time I did this diet, I lost X amount of weight in you know, the first week or whatever it is. So it, it's understanding um, kind of how to manage your expectations, I suppose. Um, and also how not to get drawn into that comparison, comparing yourself <clears throat> um, with other people. Because people's rates uh, will be different because of so many different variables. So I've done uh, basically a little case study on the board. Um, I've just invented two people. Um, we've got a, this one here, which is a 30 year old female. Okay. She has an office job. I'll call her Mary. Uh, she's got an office job, but she trains three times a week. Okay. And then my other example here is this person. So they're the same age. They went to school together. Let's say they went to school together. This is Barry. Okay. Mary and Barry. Uh, He's a 30-year-old dude, okay, he's uh, six foot two, weighs 90 kilos, and uh, he also trains uh, three times a week. Now, a couple of key differences. So, Mary weighs 60 kilos and she's five foot five, okay, it's a little bit taller than Finton, um, and she works in an office, okay? So, although she trains three times a week, her overall activity levels, because she works in an office, uh, is uh, quite low. Um, whereas Barry, your boy here, uh, he's 90 kilos, he's six foot two, um, and he's got an active job. So he's on his feet quite a lot, um, you know, has to move around. So his overall activity levels are, are kind of quite high, but they both train exactly the same amount. So first thing to consider is that training isn't necessarily uh, the best way to burn calories, believe it or not, um, because our overall expenditure, what we do for the other... 23 hours of the day is going to have more of an impact on our overall energy expenditure um, over the day and over the week. Now, this is also another key thing about strength training, is strength training can have a positive impact on your energy expenditure in the kind of 24 to 48 hours post-training, um, as opposed to, say, just conditioning work where you might go for a run. You might burn more calories within that hour of you going for a run than you would in a strength training session. However, you are more likely to, to burn less calories then throughout the day, um, or it doesn't improve what you're going to do over the next 24 to 40 hours. Again, why we're big on kind of our strength training in here. So, purpose of these examples is to just highlight a couple of things when we're talking about managing your expectations going into something. So, Mary's uh, BMR, okay, when we work it out, so a metabolic rate is roughly 13 to 1400 calories. All right, got coffee here, right. Russell. I brought Sam's name on the top. Do you want a little penis? Can you see? Can you see? Oh, I yeah, have got my camera on backwards. There you go. That's how I dread to think what yours That's looks like. That's the limit of You always draw really strange it's a ones. It's rocket. <laughs> <laughs> it's got issues. Um, so, this is Mary, right? Uh, so, a metabolic rate, because she's... So, she's a 30-year-old female. Um, she weighs 60 kilos. She's 5 foot 5. So, she's only little, okay? Uh, her metabolic rate, so how many calories she requires to just exist. So breathing, organ function, just living requires energy. The smaller someone is, the less energy it requires to, to sustain that person. Okay, um, if someone's female, they have a slightly lower metabolic rate than a male, just to do with their, um, usually their muscle mass uh, is one thing. Um, and because she works in an office, we times that or we multiply that uh, BMR by about 1.4, okay? That means that's going to give her a, her maintenance calories, okay? Or her total daily 
energy expenditure, okay? So if someone doesn't do any training, doesn't really move much, you take their BMR, metabolic rate, and you multiply it by 1.1, 1.2, okay? If someone's sedentary. If someone, like quite a lot of people in here, might train three odd times a week, but they've got quite an inactive job, then you're probably looking at about 1.4-ish, 1.5. If someone, like your man here, is quite active, you're probably looking at kind of 1.6, 1.7 to work out their maintenance calories. If someone's an athlete, you know, it can get over, over two. Now, that means that to maintain her weight, her current state, okay, she needs to eat her allowance, if I want a better word, is um, her maintenance calories are 1,900 calories a day. Now, that is... Uh, 13,000 calories, 300 uh, a week. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, cool. So that's to maintain where she's at. So if she wants to lose weight, we've got to then create a deficit. So if we eat our maintenance calories, we stay the same. If we want to drop weight, we have to come underneath our maintenance calories. Now, a good start point for a lot of people is kind of that 15 to 20% deficit. Now, I've set uh, Mary's at the top end, so 20% of 1,900 is roughly 380 um, calories. So we'd knock off 380 calories off her 1,900 to give uh, 1,520 calories, all right? So that's her target calories, roughly 1,500 calories a day, okay, to go out to lose weight. So if she was to hit that consistently, that means at the end of the week, She's got a deficit of 2,660, okay? Now, I know there's a lot of numbers going on here, but it's important that we understand that, that it is essentially a maths equation. Now, um, over a week, that's 2,660 calories. Now, in six weeks' time, if she is consistent with those calories, in six weeks, what we could expect, okay, is 2,600, okay? Multiply that by six weeks, is 15,960. Now, there's 7,000, approximately 7,700 calories in one kilo of fat, or 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. So if you take the deficit she's created over those six weeks, divide it by your kilo of fat, that means she's gonna have lost roughly in six weeks, two kilos. Now, some people would be disappointed or be like, oh, you know, two kilos in six weeks. Um, that's the reality of, of what it would take for that person to lose that amount of weight. Now, if she wanted to do that quicker, there's two ways of increasing that deficit, so creating a larger gap, and that's eating less food, which can be challenging when you've already got quite a small target anyway of about 1,500 calories, or increasing our energy that goes out. So... Training more probably isn't the answer for, for someone who's consistently training anyway. So for someone like Mary, it would be a case of, right, how can I just be more active? So step targets are a really good way of um, just being conscious about how much we actually move within a day. So setting yourself a target. It doesn't have to be an arbitrary number. Like a lot of people say 10,000. But if you've got a, Miss Mary's got a step calculator, it's a case of going, right, what do you currently do? Let's have a look at it. And then how can we increase that? Is it setting an alarm every now and then in the office? So you get up and go for a walk. Every lunchtime, go for a walk. Go for a walk before work. Um, you know, when you finish training, go for a walk. Whatever it is, how can we get you more active? Um, so you could attack it from both sides. You could try and be more active and eat less food. Or you could just eat less food. Or you could try just to be more active. The danger with going too low is that it becomes hard to sustain. Okay? Because if you eat less food... You can become hungrier, uh, you know, your energy to train, your mood, motivation, all that kind of stuff can dip. It can be really challenging. Now, if Mary's got a time constraint on her objectives, then either she should have started earlier or you might just have to suck it up and be a little bit more aggressive and that there's no right or wrong with that answer. When people say, oh, it's unsustainable, whatever, it doesn't matter, um, provided you feel you can stick to it for the duration of time you need to. The sustainability comes within the maintenance period after. So... The reason it is difficult as well is we've got a low margin for error. So I spoke with, actually spoke with somebody this morning, tracking their, well, just started tracking their calories. Now, the first couple of weeks of their 28 day, they didn't track their calories, but they said they got a rough idea of where they're at, but they hadn't lost any weight. Now, without tracking, it's very hard for me then to look at that and go, okay, well, this is, these are the obvious things that are going wrong. But started to track now, so if we can get a couple of weeks of data in, then we can help out a little bit more and help kind of figure out, um, chances are she might spot it anyway. 
but just being less margin for error. So when you've got less margin for error, what you need to do is be more accurate. So weigh your food. Chuck it on the scales before you cook it. Dry weight, uncooked weight if we can. Be more accurate with what you're doing. It's very hard when you've got less of a budget, calorie budget, to be more flexible. So again, you know, if her target's 1,500 calories, Dom, whilst we want to encourage flexibility, spending that budget on a Domino's and a couple of beers on the weekend might not be the best use of that budget. It might then create a difficult situation where it's hard to um, adhere to your goals. Um, the other thing to consider is that when we're talking a six-week period, or we're talking that's actually adhere, so sticking to her calories there, she smashed that out of the park, and she's going to lose about two kilos, that scales aren't necessarily going to show on a certainly a daily and certainly a weekly basis massive changes so um when you're jumping on a, a scales at the end of the week say you've done one week of that it's quite possible you could have lost half a kilo of body fat and be holding half a kilo of water so it can show you've not lost any weight and you think what's the point throw me toys out the pram okay and give up so it's important if you can manage your expectations going into it of what actually your rate of progress should be, you shouldn't be too disheartened with things taking time because they do. It takes time to gain fat, but people very rarely are measuring themselves on a daily and weekly basis when they're going backwards because that's the last thing they want to be doing. Um, what this can do as well, again, speaking to the, the, the person this morning, is it can force us into making rash decisions. So the person this morning actually said, oh, do you think I should just cut out carbs? Um, and it's not really the way to go. Because if you could manage your expectations going into it, you won't need to make these crazy decisions. Now, the trap of those things is if, you, if she dropped carbs this week, okay, she would probably be lighter at the end of the week. And that would then reinforce that, oh, carbs made me fat, then that's what I need to do. When in reality, most changes on the scales kind of daily and weekly are going to be more likely to do with our fluid balance or so water so if you drop carbohydrates to the floor you will lose water muscle glycogen quite quickly which is why people like to do it because it gives us that quick win of oh i lost you know seven pounds in a week or i lost lots of weight in a relatively short period of time but but if calories are the same and protein is matched then we have no extra fat loss the fat loss will come through the the severity of the deficit that we're going to create in our energy balance, whether that's coming from carbs or fats or whatever, okay? Um, and that can cause frustration. But the most important thing is to think about consistency. In reality, if you're a small female, you've got to expect progress to be relatively slow in comparison to someone who's either I've got the, the weight to lose, so someone's a little bit larger, or um, like this example here, okay, We'll show you Barry's example. So if he was to do six weeks, so at the end of each week, his maintenance, his uh, BMR is 2,042 calories, okay? So because he's active, we multiply that by about 1.6, okay? That means um, his daily target to maintain is 3,200 calories. So he could consume 3,200 calories a day and he's going to maintain his weight because he's bigger, okay? Now, he wants to lose weight, so we put him in the same... 20% deficit. So the deficit as a percentage is exactly the same. Now, what this means is that his target's 2,560 a day. So he's got a, almost 1,000 calories more a day to play with. And at the end of the week, okay, he's going to create a 4,430 calorie deficit. So he's got more calories to play with. Okay. And at the end of the week, he's got a greater deficit, which is, will translate into greater weight loss. So over six weeks, he'd be losing nearly four kilos, so three and a half kilos there, so almost double what Mary's lost. Now, that can be frustrating if you're comparing yourself to other people and say, oh, my mate lost a kilo that week, but I didn't lose any, I only lost half a kilo. And it's like, well, yeah, because you're different people with different requirements and your deficits are going to be slightly different. Now, the other benefit or the other kind of what's going to make uh, Barry's journey a little bit easier, he's got a bigger margin for error. So when we talk about spending the budget of a Domino's pizza and a couple of beers, he would probably still have a thousand calories left on that day to play with. So he has more ability or it makes it easier, sorry, to become more flexible. Relaxing a little bit at the weekends is going to be easier. 
there's more room here to increase the deficit. So if he wants to be a little bit more aggressive, he could probably quite comfortably tolerate, you know, 2,200 calories a day. So he could drop 300 calories a day off his target and still feel full and comfortable and, and, and make that easier. Now, over time, as he gets lighter, that deficit decreases because he's now lighter and it will become more challenging and weight loss will slow down a little bit. Of course it will. But it is definitely easier, okay, in that, in that situation. The process and the kind of what we have to do is exactly the same. However, some people will have it easier than others um, in the sense that just because they're either, you know, bigger, if they're male, they've got a more active job, it's easier for them to, to expend energy, then, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot more simple. So I always feel guilty if I'm ever, ever doing something like this. I don't really feel guilty about it. But if uh, Anna, my other half, is trying to, we're trying to, you know, got a holiday coming up or something, she's got a budget of 1,600 calories and I'm there eating 3,000 calories, it, it's just unfortunate. It's luck. That's all it is, is that um, it just makes my life a little bit easier. So then it's important for her to spend her calories a little bit more wisely. And this is where calorie density is a really important topic. There's a video of this in, um, I think, week three of the uh, member zone for the 28-day program and in the nutrition education section, where food volume for Mary is going to be really important. So eating a lot more vegetables, okay? Making sure we're getting adequate protein in. You know, you can still have big portions of food, but what we choose to eat becomes a little bit more important. Um, you know, spending, uh, a, you know, a quarter or a third of your calorie intake on a, a latte or a coffee from, a, um, you know, Starbucks or Nero or whatever probably isn't a wise decision for helping you adhere to your objective of getting where you want to be. Okay, so managing your expectations is really, really important. If we're relaxing at the weekends and we're merry, it's very easy for us to undo our deficit. So if, if, you know, if, that, if that gets cut by a thousand, yes, we still might be in a deficit. It means over time we're going to make progress. Of course we are. Um, but it's going to take us longer to get where we need to be. Whereas Barry over here, you know, if he has a couple of beers on the weekend and doesn't really factor it in, then he's still probably going to be in about a 3,000 calorie a, uh, a week deficit. So he's still going to have... The, the, the ability to make progress a little bit quicker. So hopefully that little maths lesson helps you understand. What this doesn't account for is the other things at play um, where over time, if you're in a calorie deficit for a prolonged period of time, things will naturally slow down anyway. So one, you'll lose weight, so you're smaller, so you require less calories to exist, which means that your deficit, if you don't change your calories, actually gets less because you're lighter, but that's your objective anyway. And the other side of things is we become less active. We might not notice it, but our body will reduce the amount of calories we expend. Um, so it's managing your step target. Control what we can control. Um, but the most important thing is being patient, okay, and committing to that long run. So anyone on the 28-day program who's, you know, only lost half a kilo after week two or whatever and getting frustrated, understand that that's perfectly acceptable, all right? It's not a a race to see how quickly you can lose weight. We can make you lose weight a lot quicker if we got you all to drop your cal uh, carbohydrates to the floor. But then as soon as you reintroduce them, you're going to gain the water weight back anyway. Okay. And when we talk about getting frustrated, so talk about that two kilos there. So it's about 2.2 uh, .2 kilos per kind of pound. All right. We've got five pounds here of body fat. So that's not far off what... Um, Mary there would have lost in those six weeks. That's quite a lot. You'd be happy with that, okay, if you could show it here, all right? So it's not being disappointed with your rate of progress. The most important thing is you focus on is your consistency. Track your, um, your food if you're unsure. Be accurate. You need to increase accuracy. If ever you're frustrated, um, there's always something going on. We cannot cheat the body, okay? People want to believe that they're special and there's something else at play and it's, you know, maybe I've got a slow metabolism or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but the chances are we, you need to investigate a little bit more. And you guys, if you ever need help with that or want one of us to look at it or post into the Facebook group, we can, we can help you investigate because we know what we're doing. Um, the final point of this was about muscle gain. Now, flip this on his head, talking about muscle gain and frustration, uh, so fat loss, sorry, and frustration on rate of progress. When we flip it and talk about muscle gain, 
This can get really frustrating because it is a painfully, painfully slow process. So um, I just put an example on the board at the bottom here. You might not be able to see that, it's quite small. But um, if someone was look a, a beginner, you might be able to gain muscle a little bit quicker than someone who's kind of intermediate or advanced. Even then, your monthly expectation is gonna be around uh, one to 1 1.5% of your body weight. So someone who's 80 kilos would, in a month, would be smashing it out the park if they gained 0.8 to 1.2 of a kilo in a month. So again, measuring that weekly is gonna be really difficult with your natural fluctuations in body weight. You've just got to trust the process. Are you strength training properly? Uh, are you getting enough protein? And are you being consistent with what you're doing? As you become more advanced, so some of our longer term members here who are more intermediate towards advanced, that again is gonna slow down. So 0.5 to one, so you're looking at 0.4 kilos a month for someone who's intermediate, smashing it out the park. You know, that, that's really hard to measure. So again, you've got to trust the process. You can gain muscle whilst in a calorie deficit over time, provided your resistance training effectively, getting stronger, and um, getting adequate protein. It's just not optimal for gaining muscle tissue. If you feel lean enough and you feel like I, I wanna commit to gaining muscle, like that's my main objective, then pushing your calories more towards maintenance and even into a slight surplus would optimize your uh, ability to gain muscle. But it's having the mental ability to realize you might get a bit fluffy around the edges as well and then really push that strength training up in the gym. Okay, so hopefully, uh, you're not all too confused by the mathematics, but it's important that you understand that to manage your expectations, getting your head around this will stop you falling into traps of, oh, I'm gonna go cut all my carbs out of my diet or do really unsustainable things that are gonna, you know, in the long term, aren't gonna solve our problems. Um, and always reach out if you need anything. The last point was answering Matt's question about drop sets and AMRAPs. So the Biggest difference, really, from, from an AMRAP set is we, it's more of a, a, a like as many reps or as many rounds as possible. Um, it's just a way of, of saying work as hard as you possibly can for the given amount of time. If we're talking in a set format, it, it might be the last set of your, uh, say, your bench press, for example, today, and you're going to go and see how many reps you can do at that point. Now, that would be your AMRAP set. The drop set would be where you would complete an AMRAP set, then you go as far as you can, okay, with good form. Then you would take some weight off, so you drop the weight, and then you repeat that process one to two times, something like that, um, because your ability to create that force, force is still there, but just not at that load. So by taking the weight off, you're having a real small rest, you're not getting complete recovery, and then you're going again. All it's there for is to create what we call metabolic stress, um, and forces us or helps us adapt in terms of from a, a muscle gain perspective. It helps us get more volume. Um, and from a, uh, the AMRAP set perspective, it's a way of measuring progress without necessarily the weight going up. So let's say you did um, your sets of bench today and you did sets of three. And then your last set, you say, I'm going to do an AMRAP set. And you've got four reps out. The next time you do it, you use the same weight, but you manage to get five reps out. You've made progress, okay, without then... It, without the weight necessarily going up in the bar. It's A, another way of increasing the volume of our training. Okay, awesome. Right, hopefully that's uh, not confused anyone too much. But if you ever have any questions on this stuff, guys, it's really important that you speak up because it's a confusing topic. There's lots of nuances to it all, um, but we want you guys to fully understand it. Take it easy, guys.